Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Lodge Carlos, I'd like to uh, thank you for giving up your time this morning. So we'll try and keep this quite brief and stick to the sort of 30, 35 minutes. So a quick introduction into myself. My name's Rob G. I work out the um, Solutions Architect team in Sydney for Lodge Carlos Group. I specialise in data centre and cloud technologies. So we're going to speak today around the six steps to kind of move from the traditional um, data centre infrastructure and move more towards a private cloud model. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, now before we really kick off into the, the steps towards private cloud and talking about some of the um, issues with traditional infrastructure, I think it's always important to kind of set out the perspective of cloud computing. One of the areas of my job that I enjoy doing a lot is obviously speaking to different customers. And one of the questions that I ask all my customers is, what is your perception of cloud computing? And the analogy that we use is like the um, you know the six blind people that feel an elephant. They're all going to describe something different. In essence, it is an elephant. And I see the same thing with uh, people who work in IT. You know, depending on if it's a CIO, an analyst, a help desk, or whoever, I ask people for their perception on cloud computing. And generally, I tend to get different answers. So things like it's anything that's a service. It's virtualization, it's a self-service portal, it's you know, on-demand computing, statelessness, it's automation, it's you know public cloud, it's the cloud, and there's no real definitive answer in what cloud is, and I think that's important to put out. It's pretty much, it is, it's on-demand computing. It's about being able to pull resources together, so CPU, RAM, storage, and offer them for applications. Where that sits, again, you know, there's different conversations to have around, does that sit within an organization's own infrastructure, is it co-located, is it their own platform, or is it, you know, out in a public um, offering like, you know, Amazon or Azure or something like that, so. Um, but again, you know, the concepts and the strategy around cloud is really on-demand compute, and then what we're going to talk about today is really the steps of how we get towards that away from the traditional infrastructure, and talk about some of the benefits of having an automation and an orchestration platform on that. So, <clears throat> Again, before we get into the six steps, it's, I always find it important to kind of set up, you know, what is the, the issues with traditional infrastructure. And I guess the first issue is obviously the, the traditional data center architecture is architecture that was built 20 years ago, okay? It was never really built with virtualization in mind. VMware was great when they came to market with um, vSphere as a hypervisor, you know, 15 years ago. Obviously, that's an enables us to, enabled us to consolidate a great deal, so server virtualization, application virtualization, um, but really the, the actual architecture has never changed. You know, I still tend to build in these islands and silos, so I've still got some compute maybe for DMZ, I've got compute for virtual desktops, I've got compute for you know, my tier one applications, I've got compute for test and dev, and that kind of filters through into storage phrase as well. So. As an example, I typically see you know organizations that start off with tier one storage, they then hit an issue where they have a capacity problem, so they'll move some of that tier one storage onto you know a separate NAS device, so a Windows storage server or a QNAP device. What that kind of means is I start to grow all of these islands. Really, what I'm looking for is, as I said, you know, to move towards this um, idyllic cloud model is being able to pull storage, CPU, RAM, and deliver it deliver it out and if I've got separate islands for storage, separate islands for compute, I end up in this scenario where I've got, you know, some compute free in pod A and some storage free in pod B, but because they're in completely separate silos and, and pods, I can't put an application on there. So what I traditionally end up doing is just going out and buying more storage and more compute and it's kind of a waste. And we'll talk more on the next slide around the idea of uniform scale. So some of the other issues that uh, these islands give me is um, support as well. So not only managing multiple different support contracts, but actually when I have a problem, actually getting support. And you know, I, before I did a um, step into an architecture role, I spent really around seven or eight years out in the field doing kind of engineering and consultancy. And I used to hit this problem all the time where I have a problem or an issue with an application. I call server vendor A. He tells me that there's nothing wrong with the server, it's the storage. I call storage vendor B, they tell me the storage is fine, it must be the network. I go to the network guy, he says, well, I can ping everything, so therefore it's not the network. And I'm back to square one. So having these islands and silos, again, gives me issues around support. 
The other interesting thing is, and again, when I speak to CIOs, in one of the key, um, or one of one of the key benefits, not so much benefits, one of the key wants that CIOs want is predictability. Okay, everyone wants predictability. Everyone wants to know what the cost is going to be, what they're going to need to budget for. You know, six months, nine months, twelve months. The idea of moving towards operational um, costs, or opex rather than capex, it all hinges and fits around fits around predictability. And again. With using multiple islands, my predictability goes out the window because it's just really difficult to predict if I'm always doing kind of ad hoc changes. The other issue that I see and I hear a lot of, um, and it's pretty much only customers that have done storage refreshes um, don't have this issue is storage is at a maximum. Okay, It's the given thing that every single organization is growing. Okay, Data's growing. I've not spoke to any organization that says, their storage sizes are the same this year as what they were last year. Equally, I never come across organizations that say, you know, we've just done a find and replace on our file server and deleted all file data that's, you know, four or five years old. And people don't delete things. People retain things. And again, if you think about it, storage is one of the, or storage growth is one of the key factors that tends to break infrastructure. And I'll, uh, I'll explain why. So typically speaking, things like HA, uh, sorry, uh, DR, business continuity, um, backup, all fit around storage. Okay, the more data I have, the more I need to replicate to a standby data center. The more I need to back up. The more that data grows, the bigger my backup windows get. The bigger my restoration windows get. I start to actually not be able to meet SLAs around restorations. And again, with um, BCP and DR, again. The more data I have, the more I need to replicate across. It becomes difficult to manage. And again, this comes back down to the um, islands and silos. And again, I see it with customers that I use the example before. They start off with one storage platform. They fill it rather than you know replace that storage platform because it's maybe a tier one storage platform. They go out and use you know a, a NAS box for a Windows storage server or even just local disk for things like file, raw file data. And this kind of comes into the complex architecture that we're only ever meant to be temporary. So, um, as I said, you know, tier one storage that can do, you know, block-based replication or snapshot backups or whatever. As soon as I move that tier two storage off my tier one storage and put it somewhere else, my backup model potentially breaks. Okay, so what do I end up doing? I end up using a second method to do backups, and that's the same with replication as well. And I've seen it in organisations, as I said, you know, start off with one product to do replication. Uh, because they've moved things around and broken more into silos, you end up with three or four different ways of doing replication or, sorry, three or four different um, uh, technologies in there to do replication, whether it be, you know, storage-based replication, SRM-based replication, even like RoboCopy or XCopy scripts. So, as I said, you know, as storage grows, we tend to, you know, uh, break our architecture. Productivity and the efficiency challenges. Again, you know, using multiple islands of technology in different silos, I've got more management points. Okay, so you know, the, the typical statement that everyone's been banding around for the last few years is, you know, IT departments spend 70% keeping the lights on and only 30% innovating. We want to kind of switch that around. Well, it's true. You know, if I've got four different storage platforms to manage, I've got three different compute platforms. I'm managing multiple hypervisors. I've got different backup software in there. I've got different HA. It stands to reason that my time is going to be spent more keeping the lights on rather than innovating. And the last point really is, again, it's something that's important, something I speak to all my customers about, is this idea of uniform scale. So this isn't anything complicated. You don't need any you know, fancy capacity planning tools. It's really a way to illustrate how traditional data center isn't fit for a cloud model. So we actually have, there's actually four main components that make up our data center, okay? Compute, network, storage. The fourth one is actually waste, um, and I'll talk about waste a bit later on. So I'm going to have a quick poll now, and we'll talk really around um, computes. So quick question. Um, how many people out there are currently using Blade technologies? Okay, cool. So at the moment we've got pretty much an even 50-50 split. And it's important because Blade technologies have 
great. You know, I've been architecting um, compute before the likes of Cisco, UCS, and Converged Data Center, and Blade technology is really cool. Okay, you know, I can potentially get 16 servers into 10 um, 10 U of rack space. Um, so you know, my power, my cooling, my um, square foot compute is really, really um, consolidated. The architecture around traditional blades is it's chassis and it's modular based. So uh, for the people on the call that aren't aware of sort of blade technology, typically I start off with a chassis. It can either be 8 or 16 um, um, blade capacity. I then put management modules in the back of it. So I typically put two uh, management modules. I then put two Ethernet modules, so 1 or 10 gig. I then put two fiber channel modules in. Okay, And I connect them up to my upstream core networks, Ethernet networks, DMZ networks, management networks, whatever. Okay, I then proceed to fill that that blade chassis. So again, really, really nice linear scale model because you know my blades are between 10, 15 grand, depending on the CPU and RAM configuration, and that's fine. Okay, I hit a problem though. When I hit the either the ninth or the seventeenth server, I've got an issue, right? Because my chassis is full, I've got nowhere to put it. So I have an option. I can continue down my blade route where I then go and buy a second chassis. I need to put more management modules in there, more Ethernet modules and more fiber channel modules. I need to cable that up to my, again, upstream networks, and I can put my 9th or 17th blade in there. Using that model actually breaks the whole model of using different blades, because what that actually means is that second chassis or to deploy that 9th or 17th server has gone from the cost of the server to the cost of chassis or modules and potentially more upstream switch ports. Okay, so that model sometimes kind of breaks. My other option is is I can just go and buy a rack mount server, which kind of defeats the whole object of why I went down blades in the first first instance. And again, I typically see customers that have been doing that, um, just because you know the cost to um, deploy that ninth or seventeenth um, blade breaks. And this again takes us back to this idea of I then end up being in a scenario where I've got you know blade computing and rack mount computing, so I've got different silos. I see the same issue with storage as well. So again, I used the example before that you know I start off with a nice fancy storage array. You know it does block-based replication. It's got a bit of snapshots in there, and I've got a load of fiber channel or SAS disks or whatever disks in there. And I put all of my workloads on there. I then hit a problem where you know I've run out of space. So what do I do? Well, I either potentially replace storage controllers, add more disk, or I then go out and buy a completely separate storage platform. So it's this idea that as we grow with our commodity data center infrastructure, so CPU, RAM, and storage, we're always going to hit a break point where we need to do a forklift upgrade. Okay? The third component is networking. You know, compute and storage, I can have the best compute and the best storage platform in the world, but without any networking, it's pretty useless because I need to connect it all together, right? And again, I see the same issue with using you know, traditional um, chassis-based core switches, even distribution switches and fiber channel hubs fiber channel networks in that I'm always going to hit a point where when I add you know server number 18 or the 18th rack mount server or the second or third chassis I run out of switch ports so I need to buy more switch ports so the idea of moving towards a private cloud deployment where I just want to offer up CPU RAM storage to my customers I need to be able to plan for capacity I need to be able to grow in a linear and scalable manner in Using the traditional data center, it's just not possible to do. Okay, and it's interesting. I see a lot of organisations that have done VDI proof of concepts. Okay, and they've tried to fit VDI into an infrastructure like this, and they fail because they just can't make the numbers stack up on the business case for deploying VDI over, you know, traditional desktops. And the issue is, is that you'll never make VDI stand up in this case because you're always going to have a problem where I need to switch on ten more desktops, which means I need another server. Well, I can justify buying a server, but I've got no more switch ports, so then need to go in, you know, buy a new distribution switch or do a, you know, a fiber channel switch replacement or buy a new line card in the server. So, I said, really, the current data center just doesn't really scale to, to uniform scale. Um, so our options. I'm going to uh, speed up now, just so we can not overrun too much. Our options. We really have three main options. Okay, we can. Keep this idea of the bolt and aftermarket. So we just tweak things and change change things as we need to. You know, we deploy the second tier two, tier three storage platform. We 
you know, run out of compute in our blade environment, so we just go and buy a rack mount server. Really gives us marginal gain, if anything, and definitely gives us increased management and overall cost. Second issue, or the, the second option we have, and typically what I see customers doing, is you know the traditional infrastructure refresh. So, you know, go out to an RFP, RFT. We need X amount of compute, storage, and network. And you know, you're going to get newer versions of CPUs. You're going to get the latest family. Um, you're going to get you know slightly better storage, maybe you know better technologies within storage. But in essence, it's the same service. You know, I'm not into um, vendor FUD, but if you take a HP server and a Dell server, take the lid off it, it's the exact same thing inside, right? The only difference is, is they've got different bezels on the front and different LEDs. And these give us the same challenges. It give us the same challenges around growth um, as I said, and scalability. The third option that we have is, you know, the leap of faith. It's the next generation of data center moving towards a cloud model. Um, we'll talk about validated infrastructure. We'll talk about, you know, SLA driven. Um, how do we actually now take that risk of you know having all of these different silos and pull our resources together that means we can offer applications that are SLA based we can start to create things like service catalogs and um, this gives us overall you know reduction in cost um, and a service improvement okay it's actually interesting when I again speak to customers and talk about cloud and you know moving to a cloud model isn't necessarily always going to save you money okay but it will definitely give you a service improvement. And that's really how we see IT departments moving in, you know, the first steps in the moving away from the 70% keeping the lights on more towards than 30% innovating and kind of switching that around. Okay. So we'll skip over this and we'll get straight into them. So to really summarize, this is really our traditional data center. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, the fourth or one of the biggest consumers of data centers is waste. Okay. We look at this, and you know, this is kind of a worst case scenario, but I've got different storage platforms. If I strip back the tin, it's the same disks within them. They're all made out of the same factory in Taiwan. I've got the same issue with networking. Typically, I cable for HA, so I've got, you know, separate Ethernet, separate fiber channel networks. I've got top of rack switches. I've got heaps of cables everywhere. You know, I just need to consolidate that and move away from a model that looks like this to a model that looks like this. Okay, and we'll discuss how we'll do that. And away from a data center that looks like that. Okay. So the first point that we need to look at really is standardization and simplification. As I mentioned before, you know, having multiple islands and silos, we're never going to be able to move towards this way of you know creating automation and orchestration across our data center. And that's really what we need to do to move towards a private cloud model. Okay, so first one is redu uh, reducing the points of management. Again, we can't automate and orchestrate a data center if there's 60 management points. It's never, ever going to happen, okay? So we need to reduce that down. We need to, again, move away from this um, vendor choice. You know, there's no point in investing in data center infrastructure just because you buy the same vendors, you know, notebooks or, or desktops, okay? So you need to think about strategic, you know, what's best for my data center and, you know, pick the best products to, to deliver that. Okay, I'm going to have another quick poll. Um, so data storage for a particular purpose. Again, I typically see customers, you know, that either go with a storage platform that delivers fiber channel or SAN and a separate storage platform that delivers NFS um, or SIS. So again, quick question, um, you know, do you actually out there see a need for having multiple protocol storage devices, a storage device that can deliver NFS, it can deliver SIS, it can deliver fiber channel or fiber channel over Ethernet. Okay, cool. And again, interesting that that's good. So we're pretty much seeing, you know, more more in the yes than the no. And well, the re reason why I throw that one out there, and again, this is um, particularly important for things like VDI. File-based protocols are becoming more and more prominent within the data center. You know, the specific use cases is why you would use NFS over fiber channel, especially in virtual desktop scenarios. We remove SCSI tree reservation issues. If you even look at what Microsoft have been doing, so SQL 2012, Exchange um, 2013, you know, Hyper-V 2012, are all supporting SIFs as an open standard now. Um, you know, again, there's use cases around it. I don't need to format a file system. I can just use a, a file-based platform. And it's a point of conversation whenever I have storage conversations. And my take is as well, just have a storage platform that can do both. You know, there's no point in limiting yourselves and your capabilities to using one or the other. There are storage platforms out there 
the unified storage platforms, you know, EMC and NetApp, they will deliver both if you need to. Okay, and this also then brings us back into you know um, standardizing and simplifying things like backup and data protection. Um, so again, you know, the more and more of this we can simplify, the better it will be that you know, we can move towards this cloud model. Driving down I/O consolidation, Tengig Ethernet is pretty much prominent. It's been around for a while. Um, is it good, Tengig Ethernet, for general network to compute networking? It's actually probably not. And the reason why is because typically in a vSphere or even a Hyper-V environment, we cable for requirement. Okay, So we cable for management networks, we cable for uh, vMotion networks, for you know vKernel networks, for IP storage, for DMZ, for VMware networks, and fiber channel networks. But with a typical vSphere host, you know, if we're adhering to VMware's best practices, there can be anything from you know 10 to 16 cables hanging out the back of that because we need to keep them traffic patterns separate. Okay, so by just replacing them one gig cables with 10 gig cables actually doesn't give me anything because all I'm doing is I'm just creating a bigger pipe that's still not going to be used. Where I, what I really want to do is consolidate my cables down. So I want to go from 10 cables to one cables. And this is where we use technologies such as data center bridging and really what Cisco came to market with, with their Nexus switching. So what I can do now is I can take a 10 gig cable, I can actually divide it up into seven different lanes, I can put fiber channel on that cable, okay, and I can use quad policies and prioritize traffic. So I can have peace of mind that I've got the one cable or the two cables for HA going to my rack mount server that's delivering my fiber channel storage, it's delivering some system NFS, it's delivering um, vMotion traffic and all the other networks that I, I need to deliver. But if I start doing a vMotion and that vMotion network starts getting saturated, it's not going to affect my fiber channel network, even though it's on the same cable, so it's not going to start my storage. So IO consolidation, again, it's one of the, the key areas that we need to do because one of the most um, cost prohibitive break points that we have in data center is when we need to grow the network. Networks generally aren't that easy to grow. Okay, so IO consolidation really, really key. I'll just move on to the next one. Storage efficiency. Uh, I'm going to cover this off real quick because I wanted to spend some more time on the kind of last last two slides really. So again, storage efficiency. You know, we don't just want dumb disk anymore. Um, we've already spoke about data growing exponentially so we want to use you know storage um, efficiency technologies things like deduplication div provisioning storage tiering in order to start to shrink our, um, our storage footprints down and you know make our cost per gigabyte a terabyte um, less and again you know when we talk about the technologies that EMC and NetApp bring to market this is really where they start to outshine from a storage sense um, so I'm going to skip over that slide Okay. Um, step four is really around automation. So again, you know, this idea of being able to pull resources together and you know offer up my CPU and RAM pretty much as and when I need to. And this is really where we start talking about what Cisco would do with UCS. So UCS is Cisco's unified compute system. It was a compute system that's been developed with virtualization in mind. So typically with a rack or a blade serve, you know, once I deploy it into my um, racks, I connect it to my various networks, I install an operating system on it, that server is going to run with its use, okay? I can't really put a different workload on it easily because um, I need to recable it and, you know, reinstall a different operating system on it. So typically that server runs its purpose until I either decommission it um, and, you know, reprovision it or it runs to its end. So the idea around automation with UCS is simple. I'm going to ex extract all of the unique identifiers on a server, so things like MAC addresses, WWPNs, UUIDs, and I can actually start to create templates and profiles for servers. And this kind of opens up a whole new idea of how I can, you know, use and reuse servers. So as an example, you know, I can take a VMware vSphere farm that's got 10 servers in it, and that runs my workloads on a day-to-day -day basis. However, during the evening, obviously when everyone's gone home, you know, I can drill that down from 10 servers to probably two or three. So my options are really I can power the other, you know, seven or eight off and save a bit of power. What I can do with UCS is I can actually repurpose these servers. So I can say, well, you know, Blade A, during these hours you're going to run as a vSphere host or whatever. 
but then after six o'clock, what I'll do is I'll shut that host down, and I'll apply a different profile to it. So I'll turn you into a, a SQL server or a SAP HANA server, and during the evening you could run data analytics or something. So I can actually start to repurpose my server hardware on the fly as I need to. And this also um, enables things like rapid provisioning as well. So you know, if I'm going to deploy a new application and it's bare metal or a new vSphere host or whatever, I can have that service profile and everything pre-created and ready to go so that you know, I order the server, I receive it from um, shipping, I literally put it into the rack, I assign the profile on it, the operating system's installed, all the networking's been pre-configured, all my VLANs are all set and have been um, presented to the server, my storage is presented, and you know my server boots and I'm ready to go. So in terms of provisioning as well, it speeds provisioning up. You know, typically with a rack mount server, if we've got a cable to different networks, and you know, we're then going to rely on the network guy to do his bit, the storage guy to do his bit. You know, it can be anything from a couple of days to even a week or two weeks to provision a new server. So you know, using automation and the smarts within Cisco UCS, I can have that provisioning time down to 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. So, as we spoke before around, you know, uniform scale, and again, we'll kind of start to summarize now, I'm just, just getting cautious of time. Um, the traditional data center, all the islands and silos, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, because it's served us well for the past 20 odd years, ever since I've been in IT anyway, but we're not going to be able to take that infrastructure and use it as a basis for cloud, especially private cloud, it's just not going to work. So what we do with UCS is, I'll talk about UCS real quick. Um, we basically abstract all of the management, all of the uh, modules and everything from the chassis and we basically create what are known as fabric interconnects, okay? They're basically the brains and to give you an example, a pair of fabric interconnects in the Cisco UCS world will drive up to 160 servers today, uh, earmarked for 320 in the next release of the software. Um, I'll take the same with, you know, either using NetApp or EMC, a unified storage platform that can deliver deduplication, thin provisioning, you know, storage-based replication, block-based replication, okay? So I make an investment in, you know, my management points, my brain, so my fabric is to connect to my storage controllers, and then as I grow, I just add the commodities what I need, so my RAM CPU, uh, my SAS SATA, or, you know, my tier, well, ultra solid-state um, storage, and this enables me to grow much more linearly. I've got a single virtualized data center network running on Cisco Nexus, so I remove the requirement for having you know multiple different networks. So my switch port count goes down, my cable count goes down. As I said, from a, a compute sense, you know the ability to just add more blades. Yes, there's still going to be a, a slightly bigger cost when I add that ninth blade because I need a chassis, but because of the architecture with Cisco, yes, Cisco UCS. Chassis are done. There's no configurable mon uh, management, Ethernet, or fiber channel modules in the back of it. So I'm literally just buying a chassis to slot blades into. All of the management and um, uh, bandwidth and management is all stored within these fiber interconnect. And I have the same from the storage sense here as well. So as I said, this gives me the ability to grow out and scale a lot more linearly than the um, traditional model and you know typically we see private cloud or enterprise public cloud vendors doing this so Logicalis we run a um, enterprise public cloud our architecture is based on FlexPod which is pretty much this architecture here you know the likes of Telstra they, they run the same model as well so it's proven data center infrastructure so it really moves us away from this idea of having no uniform scale to I've got one fifth of the networking so that breaks that fault lift upgrade requirement for doing fiber channel network, you know, redeployment. So you know, having to add more line cards, distribution layers. So my compute and storage scale out a lot more um, uh, highly density or, or densely. The last point that we want to add. So what we've spoken about with points one to five is really converged data center. It's nothing new. It's been around now. Cisco brought this. To market in 2009, 2010. It was an example. I always say, you know, Cisco don't make servers; they make routers and switches. Cisco are now the second; they've got the second uh, largest shipment of blades globally. So they kind of Cisco and HP kind of swap around like once every month. So you know, for an organisation that just makes routers and switches, we're number two in the blade architecture. Oh, sorry, number two in the blade architecture. 
um, shipping globally. So the last point that I really wanted to add is, as I said, converged data center gives us the ability to scale. Um, really, the last point to move towards this true cloud model is, you know, being able to add things such as automation, orchestration, create self-service catalogs, and pass, um, you know, management back onto my end users is around putting an orchestration or a management platform. So the one that we're going to speak around today is Cisco UCS Director. Yeah, it used to be known as Cloudpure. And this is pretty much you know, a management and orchestration tool built for Nexus. It's built for UCS. It's built for EMC or NetApp storage. And this enables me to create things like self-service catalogs, you know, provi uh, provision web service portals. So my customers can go in and request applications. They can request if it's gold, silver, bronze service catalog, what SLAs are given around that service catalog. So they can then choose you know, which applications and what SLAs are going to be formed around their applications. It also gives us the um, ability to do things like chargeback and showback. I know chargeback's not big on um, some customers' agendas. They say, you know, we're never going to do internal recharge. It goes back to one of my points I made earlier around, you know, CIOs want predictability. If I can actually show my CIO or CFO, you know, a nice graph as to these are the resources that we have. So this is my compute and storage. And I can actually show which applications are consuming these resources and also which departments are consuming these resources. So in six months when I you know, take my hat off and I want some more storage or blades or racks, um, and I need to write the business case as to why I need you know, an extra 10 terabytes, and I can actually say, well, you know, marketing are consuming 30% of our entire storage platform. You know, test and dev are consuming X. So it actually means that for predictability, showback is, you know, it is definitely a benefit. And again, I've seen organizations that try and create showback um, methods and try and do showback. If you've got 60 management points, if you've got all of these different silos and islands, it's never going to happen. You may be able to do 50% of it, but you're never going to get to a, a true picture. So automation and orchestration, really key. Um, and what's interesting really about these, these, these six steps is it isn't something that you need to do a rip and replace. You know, we're not saying go and throw away your traditional data center and just completely move to this. It literally can be six steps. So you know, when your network comes up for a refresh, rather than just going with traditional separate Ethernet, fiber channel networks, look at a converged network design system to like Cisco Nexus. And again, when compute comes up, you know, rather than just buying buy an X amount of blades, let's look at using something like Cisco UCS in there. And again with storage as well. The automation and orchestration is really the, the you know the, the final piece really. So where this kind of brings us is it, it takes us from our traditional data center, which is we've spoke about, you know, a bit of a mess, a cable for requirements, not really for capacity. Um, you know, I've got unused, underutilized networks. I've got underutilized storage. Again, underutilized, you know, blades and wrap mounts. It takes us away from this model and takes us, as I said, towards this model. So really now virtualized at five layers. Um, as I mentioned before, vSphere were great for server virtualization. You know, they enabled us to um, save a lot of money with server and application virtualization. But now we can also virtualize our compute hardware as well. We can make compute, TPU around work a lot better for us. We can virtualize storage as well. Okay, we can virtualize I/O, virtualize cable counts. You know, the fact that we can go from 16 cables to two cables on a server for me is just you know it's, it's superb. This then brings us on to obviously data center virtualization as well, which we've not really covered today. Um, but again, you know, moving towards virtual data centers, um, even physically split over multiple sites as well. So I'm going to skip on. So just um, two more slides. So pretty much the architecture that we've spoken about today is converged data center architecture, um, and we're using you know best of breed uh, best of breed architecture for this. So there's two main kind of plays. There's FlexPod, which is using NetApp storage, and vSpecs, which is using EMC storage. And now the difference with these architectures are that what's known as CVDs or Cisco Validated Designs. Okay. One of the questions that I always used to get asked when Cisco first came to market with, you know, virtualized network and virtualized computers, it's new, it's different, is it going to work? 
And you know, the end answer is yes. Okay. So Cisco work with VMware, they work with Citrix, I said NetApp, EMC, SAP, Microsoft, and they basically create validated designs. If you go down the route of, you know, deploying NetApp EMC with Hyper V, SAP, VMware, whatever, the publicly available designs that basically say if you implement in these steps, then you know we've done it, we've labbed it, we guarantee it's going to work. And that also means that in the back end there's cooperative support models as well. So if you have an issue with one of these infrastructures, you call Cisco and they say, well, it's not an issue with compute, but you've got NetApp storage, well, they'll back the call to NetApp as well. Okay, so the vendors will all work cooperatively as well. Okay, and as I mentioned before, you know, we run our entire um, public enterprise cloud on FlexPod. Okay, so one more slide. So just again, talking around converged data center marketplace. So the market leaders out there is FlexPod, DBlock, and vSpecs. And I guess, look, you know, the common denominator is they're all running Cisco Compute and Cisco Networking. The main differentiator is literally just the difference, the difference on storage. And we're open to talk about, you know, why would you use one storage platform over the other? Um, there's use cases for both. So I apologize for running slightly over. Um, with that, if there's any questions?